it is really not only a great pleasure, but a, a real honor to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, Annette uh, Magnussen, who will set the scene with her speech on the expanding universe of climate change dispute. Um, and uh, Annette and myself, we have shared many common years in our former roles as Secretary Generals of VIAG and SCC respectively. Um, and Annette, she left um, SCC in 2021, April, if I'm not mistaken, and um, then founded the Climate Change Council, a group of experienced lawyers with a shared passion for climate, sustainability and innovation. Um, Annette's focus is on leadership, innovation and policy advocacy, and she works with clients primarily in matters relating to systematic change, through research, trainings, and is also engaged in high-level dialogues with management to foster change. She holds more than 20 years of experience in international law, including from global law firms, and um, is also the founder of the crowdsourcing initiative Stockholm Treaty Lab. Annette is a frequent speaker on law and climate change and has been called the thought leader and global star by GAR. Um, and she was listed as highly recommended in Who's Who Legal 2022 for her significant experience in complex in investment and commercial arbitration proceedings. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to have you here today, um, and I look forward to many joint um, initiatives. Annette, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elise, and thank you, Herfrid and Adolf, also for the invitation to, to be here and to kick off your, your uh, series of webinars on a very important topic and very timely. Um, my, my task here today is to sort of uh, give a, uh, an introduction, and, and uh, uh, Elise invited me to pick the topic myself. So that the title that I have cho chosen for this talk is uh, The Expanding Universe of Climate Change Disputes. Um, so this is a bird's eye perspective of climate change disputes. And I know that over the this afternoon and next week, uh, you will have an opportunity to really go into some of the details uh, of, this, uh, of this topic. Um, I will begin by saying a few words about what we could include when we talk about climate change disputes, what the landscape in the intersection of climate change and disputes may, may look like. And I will share some examples from international arbitration and litigation on what we know so far on what we may find under the heading climate change disputes. Uh, and I think we have much to come in this space going forward because um, we have probably only just seen the beginning of this new field. So if we begin by looking then at, at arbitration and to understand climate change related disputes and arbitration, we could use the definition from the 2019 report from the International Chamber of Commerce resolving climate change related disputes through arbitration and ADR. And the report identifies three categories of climate change related disputes. The first category of climate change related disputes as defined by the ICC report, this category involves commercial projects with investors and other contracting parties acting in line with Paris Agreement commitments. So these are disputes under specific transition, adaptation and mitigation contracts. This could include energy transition initiatives, transition of infrastructure, so including transport and buildings, but also innovation of industrial systems. And this is a category of contracts that is likely to increase as net zero commitments, both in public and private sector is hopefully gaining momentum in the years to come. The April 2022 United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change the, uh, report, the IPCC report from Working Group 3, and Working Group th 3 is focusing on mitigation and adaptation. The, this report, uh, the IPCC report, um, was, was describing what is expected, what we need to see to meet the effects of the climate crisis. And the IPCC report noted, for example, that an increasing number of issues relating to mitigation and adaptation is likely to be negotiated in the private domain. Another example of how transition and mitigation is moving to the forefront of commercial activities in an to an extreme, increasing extent, of course, is the global campaign Race to Zero under the auspices of the United Nations and the UNFCCC. As of September last year, the coalition of net zero initiatives as mobilized by the campaign represented more than 11,000 non-state actors, including more than 8,300 companies and close to 600 financial institutions. 
all activities under initiatives like the Race to Zero campaign will have to rely on contracts. And these are also disputes that I've, and, and sorry, and, and disputes under these contracts are the kind of disputes we have found in this first category of climate related disputes in the IPCC report. Disputes under specific transition, adaptation, and mitigation contracts. The second category of climate related disputes are disputes under general commercial contracts, which, which may have no specific climate change related purpose, but where the focus of the contract may well be directly or indirectly impacted by the climate crisis. So these are the contracts not specifically related to transition, adapt adaptation, and mitigation, but which may be directly or indirectly impacted by the climate crisis. We know that the effects of climate change are associated with a wide range of risks. We have the regulatory risks, the risks of disruption as regulatory changes are being introduced at an increasing pace across jurisdictions. We have the physical risks, the effects of global warming. Uh, we are seeing that on um, the extreme weather events, which may impact infrastructure, it may lead to resource scarcity and it may impact supply chains. Just to mention a few examples of the physical risks. The financial risks, access to capital and the flow of capital is greatly affected across markets. And this of course includes effects of the regulatory changes we are seeing. And I think this is something that will be discussed more later today and, and over the course of this webinar series. And last but not least, the commercial and reputational risks as market preferences may suddenly shift or the priorities of future talent may shift. These risks associated with climate change may well materialize as commercial disputes under contracts with no climate change related purpose, but disputes under these contracts may well be characterized as climate related disputes. A third category of climate change disputes as contained in the ICC report are the sub uh, submission agreements. So where the arbitration agreement is entered into only after the dispute has arisen. These, the submissions agreements are typically rare, but the report notes that it has been argued by some that submission agreements could be of particular value in a context where disputes arise for reasons associated with climate change. Moving then into the definition of climate change disputes in litigation context. This is another area um, where we're seeing a growing, which is, which is growing going forward and which is, has sort of expanded in recent years. In climate litigation, the climate change connection in the cases could be organized also in different categories and different types of cases. Uh, and one way of uh, categorizing the cases is to use the definition as offered by the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics. And one of their recent reports on global trends in climate change litigation, where cases are organized into categories as first, uh, cases where the climate change is at the center of the legal arguments. Secondly, cases where climate change is a peripheral issue in the case. And a third category of cases include the cases where the climate change element is incidental. In cases where climate change is at the center of the legal argumentation, the cases are directly referring to climate change and climate law. For example, the Paris Agreement. In the cases where climate change is a peripheral issue of the dispute, these, there could be an explicit reference to climate change, but parties rely on other grounds to call for climate related change. So, for example, this could be actions related to air pollution, uh, there could be obligations under emissions trading schemes um, relating to the protection of land and forests, and so on. And as we will see further on, the list of grounds relied on in these category cases is very much part of the expanding universe of climate disputes. And the third category of cases, the incidental climate cases, includes cases that have practical implications for climate change mitigation and adaptation, but do not make any specific reference to climate. And this third category of cases aligns with, the, with these cases in the ICC report, which is their labeled as disputes under contracts not specifically related to transition, adaptation, and mitigation. So here is where you could say uh, an alignment or an overlap between the international arbitration and litigation. I think a, a common denominator in both litigation and international arbitration has always been that the strategies and the substance of the disputes reflect developments or trends, if you like, that we are seeing in society at large. So in my mind, 
disputes always constitute a reflection of events and priorities in the world in which it operates. Geopolitics, the general state of the economy, black swans on the world scene like the pandemic or the climate crisis. Sooner or later, developments in these or other areas will be visible in the caseload of courts and tribunals around the world. And as the world is gearing up to meet the climate change challenge at different levels, both in the public and the private sector, we are likely to see an increasing presence of climate related issues in dispute resolution settings going forward. And this is the expanding universe of climate change disputes. The expanding universe relates both to numbers, the number of cases and to substance. And if we begin by looking at litigation here, um, we can see that the use of courts to advance action on climate change, climate change is a growing phenomenon. Since 2015, the total number of known climate-related litigation cases has more than doubled. Just over 800 cases were filed between 1986 and 2014, and over 1,200 cases have been filed in the last eight years, bringing the total number in available databases to 2,000. And it is worth pointing out that roughly one quarter of these were filed between 2020 and 2022. So the trend of growing number of, uh, number, growing number of cases is quite clear. The expansion of the universe of climate disputes not only applies to the number of cases, but also to the legal argumentations and the actors involved. Recent developments in climate litigation reveal that the presence of corporate actors in these cases is increasing. Not only carbon majors are now being targeted, but climate change disputes include many more industries, the food industry, transports, plastics and finance sectors, just to mention a few. And in parallel, arguments and strategies also develop. We see more diversity in their arguments being used. Litigants challenge, for example, corporate inaction, a perceived lack of responsibility or insufficient or inappropriate communication on climate change. Greenwashing cases has become a very visible trend in courts around the world. And of course, last week we could read in the news that the directors of Shell are being personally sued in London over alleged flaws in the, economy's climate in the company's climate strategy. Claimants hold that the company directors put the company at financial risk in not taking sufficient action as the world transitions to clean energy. This lawsuit is filed by Client Earth and supported by a number of institutional investors, including, for example, the Swedish Pension, Pension Fund, AP3. And the case is filed under the UK Companies Act by Client Earth as a shareholder of the company. And, and where the claimants allege that the directors have breached their duties under the UK's Companies Act by failing to create an energy transition strategy that aligns with the Paris Agreement. As far as we know, this is the first time shareholder activists have sought to hold the directors of a company personally liable for an allegedly unrealistic net zero plan. And the case is perhaps the most recent example of how corporate law is used to advance climate action. I think it is likely that we will see a continued development of new climate related case strategies in courts around the world like this one. Introducing more climate change aligned aligned arguments and litigation may also lead to an increasing use of scientific evidence in the courtroom. Climate change attribution litigation is a fascinating and growing field. How much contribution from one specific actor is enough to establish causality? How much power and control over a substantial amount of greenhouse gas emissions do individual actors have? And how are they using this position to prevent dangerous climate change? These are some of the issues raised which may invite climate science into the courtroom. The outcome of climate litigation may also lead to new legal norms, and this is probably where we find the strongest link between climate litigation and climate change related elements in international arbitration. New interpretations of legal frameworks through a climate change lens, which may lead courts to carve out new boundaries for rights and obligations under the applicable law, may well surface also in international commercial arbitration as part of case strategies and decision-making under the same applicable law. If we move over then to looking at arbitration, the number of cases with climate change elements in international commercial arbitration are not so easily ascertained as in climate litigation because it, the numbers are simply not as accessible. 
The general principle of confidentiality in international commercial arbitration prevents a closer look, although some institutions have published reports on the topic, and I will come back to this in just a minute. Investment arbitration, on the other, on the other hand, is generally more accessible to reviewing the substance on the totality, but from a comparative perspective and for the purpose of this talk, uh, I will focus on international commercial arbitration. International investment arbitration, for example, represents a, a, a fairly small portion of all arbitration cases being filed uh, in the world. And just to give some figures as a background to that statement, we know, for example, from the UNCTAD Investment Policy Hub that the total number of investor state cases are slightly over 1,200 in totality, whereas if you look at annual caseload of major commercial arbitral institutions in 2021, that figure was around 7,000. So that's in one year. So, <clears throat> and that figure in 1992 was slightly over 1,100 cases. Now, these figures come with a caveat that uh, they are not scientific uh, in their precision to the extent that we know that institutions report numbers differently. Uh, and what do you include when you, when you say international cases and so forth? But the trend is quite clear. International commercial arbitration has experienced a vast and a huge growth over the past 30 years. Now, of course, climate change and international investment disputes is a very important and, ve and very relevant topic, as many of you watching here this afternoon will be quite aware. But again, for the purpose of this talk here today, I will focus on commercial disputes. And we know that international commercial arbitration has been a standard element of international trade and economic development for a long time. The growth of international arbitration, as demonstrated by the numbers, has aligned with and supported an exponential increase in international trade during a period characterized by tremendous growth of the entire global economy. One way of understanding then how international arbitration contributes to the expanding universe of climate related disputes is to analyze general commercial activities associated with reaching the Paris Agreement targets. It is safe to assume that the societal transition ahead to a large extent will be governed by commercial contracts, many of which will include an arbitration clause. And returning then to the reports mentioned earlier from some institutions on this topic, the ICC report from 2019 includes an overview of some major arbitral institutions and their caseload relating to societal transition associated with climate change. And it notes that many of the cases are exactly within those industries that are expected to play a key role when it comes to the societal transition. The SSC Arbitration Institute in Stockholm has published two reports on green technology disputes, one in 2019 and one at the end of last year. And here, a number of different examples are, include, are, are included relating to the green technology. For example, sustainable forestry, um, organic food, organic waste management, and carbon reduction technologies. The second report that came out at the end of last year noted that the renewable energy sector were the most common examples of green technology disputes. And another interesting detail was that the share of parties with carbon reduction as their main business had increased since the first edition of the report. But these reports from the ICC and the SSC, they still represent a mere glimpse of the substantive issues related to climate change as seen in international commercial arbitration around the world. And I personally think it would be fantastic if other institutions would follow suit and publish their own analysis of green elements in their caseloads. So maybe in the future, just as institutions today report on diversity, they will, going forward, they will also report on um, climate change related issues in their caseload. Let's hope. What can we expect then from this expand, expanding universe going forward? What substantive, substantive issues will we see in the cases? Well, we know that, the, of course, that the energy transition rests at the heart of most climate change my, uh, mitigation scenarios. The International Energy Agency has stated that an annual investments in clean energy need to become almost four times higher than today to meet the Paris Agreement net zero by 2050 target. The IEA also predicts that almost half of the reductions in 2050 are expected to come from technologies that are currently at the demonstration or prototype phase. And in some industries, the share of emissions, um, emission reductions that will come from 
technologies under development is even higher. When large scale and complex investments are deployed at an accelerated pace, disputes are more likely to occur. We are therefore likely to see the energy transition reflected also in the caseload of international arbitration going forward. Climate litigation is also expected to expand and expected to expand into new areas of law involving a more diverse set of actors. As alluded to earlier, this may influence also how climate related international arbitration cases are decided. As arguments and strategies develop, in particular in climate litigation involving corporate actors, and as legal boundaries and definitions evolve, new standards on climate change related issues are likely to become relevant also for substantive issues heard in the international arbitration. So put in other words, climate change may influence the definition of existing legal norms. This could include the definition of fiduciary duties, the boundaries of proper financial risk management, uh, and other issues as they are now being currently re-examined in many jurisdictions. And this happens in parallel as the effects of climate change become more visible across markets. Climate litigation outcomes is likely to continue to influence and change the regulatory framework. And this also will have potential consequences for commercial actors and their contractual relationships. Climate related weather events is another example of a scenario which may lead to an increase of contractual disputes and initiation of arbitral proceedings. As climate risks become a reality with flooding, degradation of coastlines and other physical effects, commercial disputes are likely to follow. All of these expanding elements of climate change disputes uh, will be reflected in how commercial disputes are being argued and how they are being decided. So far, I have talked mostly about the substance of climate change disputes, but one question that may be asked is, of course, if the expanding universe of climate change disputes will also have any effect on the procedures applied. Could a climate change element in the dispute motivate a different procedure? And my answer to that would be yes. We know from reports issued by the, Internet, by the IPCC, but also from the analysis of the IEA, the International Energy Agency that mentioned earlier, that time is of the essence in concluding transactions and projects of relevance for climate change mitigation and adaptation. To maintain the goals of the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degree target, things need to happen fast across societies. Global emissions need to be reduced by 50% by 2030 and climate neutrality or net zero needs to be reached by 2050. And as demonstrated by the IEA report, reaching net zero by 2050 will require immediate and massive deployment of all available clean and efficient energy technologies combined with a major global push to accelerate innovation and finance. A time-consuming and costly dispute is never high on the list of priorities for any corporation. And against the background of a dire need for fast societal transition, it should be even less so. For climate conscious parties and their council, the flexibility of international arbitration could represent an opportunity to approach the procedure with an open mind and a willingness to adapt the procedure to needs motivated by the climate crisis. So this could include ad hoc shortening of the procedure or an increased willingness to share experiences from the sub substance of the dispute outside of the usual boundaries of confidentiality of commercial arbitration. The climate crisis also adds another factor to the long list of advantages of mediation for the purpose of maintaining a constructive business relationship. Successfully conducted, mediation is a fast and constructive way with, to, by which a uh, with a strong potential of maintaining good business relationships for continued collaboration. This is just what we need to continue the transition towards a low carbon economy. So any more challenges ahead now, you may ask? Well, the theme for this webinar is ESG in EU-related supply chains. And of course, the acronym ESG is likely to represent yet another example of climate change-related disputes ahead. The developments of ESG standards and reporting is very much regulation-driven, but the regulation is perceived by many as unclear or incomplete. 
This may expose, for example, financial institutions to the potential legal actions for incorrect or misleading information regarding the ESG attributes of their financial products, or corporations to potential legal actions by customers or regulators, as well as by buyers in the event of mergers and acquisitions. But I'm sure that the experts stepping in after me will be able to explain how to best navigate in this complex landscape. So this has brought me to the end of this um, presentation. And I would like to end by quoting the US physicist, Stephen Hawking, who is, have been quoted as saying that the universe is expanding at an ever increasing pace. It will expand forever, getting emptier and darker. In contrast, I believe that the expanding universe of climate change disputes will not be empty. I hope it will be filled with innovation and motivation, and that hopefully it will support a path which keeps us below 1.5 degree uh, in the, by 2050 or the 1.5 degree target. So with this, I thank you so much for your attention, and thank you again for the invitation to to. Uh, to speak with you this afternoon, and I look forward to the rest of this webinar series. Thank you.